Welcome to week two of Research Methods. I hope you all had the opportunity to read this week's assignments related to naturalistic observation. As you should recall, naturalistic observation is about studying the world around you as it occurs and recording what you see. As I share information with you today, I will address three learning objectives. Specifically, you will be able to explain the differences between System 1 and System 2 knowing, to define nine types of illusions and memory distortions, and to recognize how to avoid illusions of knowing. As you recall from last week's lecture on naturalistic observation, Lincoln and Guba discussed one of the primary duties and challenges is that you are the research instrument. This means that you, the individual, are using your senses to collect data. Because we are all human, we are using our subjective abilities to observe, collect, and code data. Because the quality of data is paramount in qualitative research, we must be keenly aware of anything that may impact how we think we know. Our first assignment in the qualitative section of this course will be a naturalistic observation. And to prepare you, we are going to spend time in today's class learning about observations we make and potential biases we introduce into the data collection process. As a professor, frankly, it never occurred to me that I would need to convince students that the ways of knowing that they have used in the past are not the best ways of knowing. In one of our course textbooks, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning, written by Peter Brown, Henry Rodiger, and Mark McDaniel, this concept is described as avoiding illusions of knowing. By understanding these potential errors, we can be aware of their impact on our judgments and decision making. Throughout today's lecture, I will describe a scenario and then introduce definitions and an example that will help you understand this better. Using the information from Make It Stick as a guide, I'm going to walk you through two systems of how we think we know and nine different things that can impact our knowing. Daniel Kahneman, the author of Thinking Fast and Slow, describes what he calls two systems of knowing. System one is automatic and is described by being immediate, intuitive, and unconscious thinking. System two is described as thinking that is controlled, reasonable, and conscious analysis. In their piece for the Marketing Society, Crawford Hollingworth and Liz Baker provide this example to demonstrate the difference between system one and system two thinking. A bat and a ball cost $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? System 1 thinking results in the answer being 10 cents. The actual answer is 5 cents. When you stop to process this puzzle, you are using System 2 thinking. We'll now focus on the second learning objective, defining nine types of illusions and memory distortions. I grew up in a small town in northwestern Ohio, and I went to college near Detroit, Michigan. When I found myself having difficulty making new friends, I told myself that it was because I was from a small town with a population of 1,200, where everyone essentially looked the same, went to the same churches, and generally lived in the surrounding area after graduation from high school. Now I was in a very diverse setting with a much larger population, so certainly growing up in Edgerton, Ohio was impacting my ability to make friends. We call this a hunger for narrative. We match our own lives to these events to resolve any dissonance. A common example used to describe imagination inflation involves interviewing a child suspected of being a victim of child abuse. If the interviewer asks the child if a specific act was committed, the child may believe the event occurred, even if it didn't. Unfortunately, the risk of imagination inflation in this scenario can discredit a child who, in fact, has suffered abuse. Suggestion is the third category of memory distortion and involves how a question is asked. Can you see a vase in this picture? Well, yes, I do. Because I asked you if you could see a vase, you likely missed the two faces looking at each other. Because I've primed you with a suggestion, it becomes difficult to see anything but what I have suggested. When faced with sensory overload, our judgment can be adversely impacted. In the horrifying cases where parents left their children in their car seats, distractions and interference are often cited as primary causes. This fourth type of illusion, interference. A few years ago, we took our children, ages 8 and 9 then, to the Souter Village Living History Museum in Archibald, Ohio. While looking at the display of old telephones, I suggested to my 8-year-old son that he dial our home phone number. He looked at me with a confused face and asked, how do I dial? I repeated my request. He said he didn't know how to dial. 
it had not occurred to me that he had never seen or used an analog telephone before. When he did start to dial, he didn't know how to use the rotary dial. In hindsight, it is very humorous, but at the time he was embarrassed. This is an example of the curse of knowledge. I have been told since I was a child that my paternal grandfather was half Cherokee Indian, resulting in me believing I was one-eighth Native American. My father's sister is a member of the Southeastern Cherokee Council. My mother, who grew up in Appalachia within a mile of my father, also grew up believing my grandfather and father were of Cherokee descent, not something that was necessarily prized in the 1940s and 1950s. I have seen pictures of my grandfather, and he does appear to have features and skin tone associated with Native Americans. Stories abound of how my grandfather's heredity came to be. I have shared many times I am one-eighth Native American. Imagine my surprise when my two sisters and I submitted samples to Ancestry DNA and not one of us had any Native American DNA markers. This feeling of knowing something is the sixth type of memory distortion. My children have always attended faith-based schools and have been able to repeat religious doctrine from an early age. However, not until my children completed confirmation were they actually fluent in their faith. Just because they could recite doctrine did not make them fluent. Fluency is the seventh type of memory distortion. During this national election cycle, it is fairly easy to find examples of social influence in a variety of media sources. Terms like fake news and alternate reality have become commonplace. Social influence is the eighth type of memory distortion. Imagine the number of people who will be surprised on November 4th when their candidate for President of the United States does not win. Because we are ingrained in our own beliefs, we are often surprised that everyone doesn't share our view. This is the false consensus effect. So far, I've defined System 1 and System 2 knowing, as well as nine types of illusions and memory distortions that can impact judgment. Now I'll share two suggestions for implementation which address the third learning objective, recognizing how to avoid illusions of knowing while collecting qualitative data. By understanding what makes you think you know something, you will be able to understand the cues that lead you to believing you have learned something. Are you able to quickly retrieve information over time? As you reflect over similar situations, do you feel like you can apply what you know? Understanding cues is a purposeful process. The first suggestion is to consciously hold yourself accountable for how you acquire information. Are you using reliable sources? Challenge yourself to test the quality of evidence. As you are collecting data for your naturalistic observation, be specific in how you operationally define characteristics. As an example, do not simply write down, you see an old woman. You need to be able to define old as well as young. You also need to be able to define how you know you are seeing a woman. What characteristics led you to this conclusion? Be specific. The second suggestion involves testing yourself in your process. Hold yourself to a standard that if somebody else was using your code sheet, they would arrive at the same conclusions, in this case of gender and age, that you did. Your data collection process needs to be transparent. As you consider the nine illusions and memory distortions, you can understand the impact on System 1 knowing. Because System 1 knowing is described as being immediate, subconscious, and prone to biases and fallacies, the nine illusions and memory distortions can definitely impact judgment and decision making. Purposeful use of testing and cues to understand how you process and understand information leads to System 2 knowing, which is controlled and analytical. I'd like to now use the remainder of our class period to discuss how System 1 and System 2 knowing and illusions and memory distortions are related to our first topic in qualitative research methods, naturalistic inquiry.